morning, everybody. Matt Gaston, First United Methodist Church, Plano. Welcome to God's Cathedral as the Easter season continues and new life abounds. We're glad you're in worship this morning. Hope that you'll take time to register. Notice that give button that allows you to give regularly and thankfully for the ministries of the church that you're enjoying right now. You'll also find the opportunity to download our Connecting Conversations that ties you directly into conversation about what we will be preaching about, what we'll be talking about today, so that you and those with you can have some informed conversation about what God's doing from God's Word. We also want you to know that on April 25th, we'll be having a town hall meeting that allows you to participate virtually and ask the questions of all that's going on in the life of the church. Lastly, as people continue to come to worship, you don't have to register anymore. We do ask you to bring your mask. We do ask you to practice social distancing, but from here on, just come. Come and be in God's house together where the spirit of the risen Christ will be with us. God bless. Happy Sunday, children. And children, if you are at home listening, would you come in just a little bit closer to the TV, like if your parents will let you? Because I have a story to share with you. In the Bible, there's this passage that says, little children love each other, not by telling each other you love each other, but by acting like you love each other. And that makes me think of a story about my granddaughter. She is three years old. Her name is Jolie. She has a best friend that she's had for three years since she was eight weeks old. They go to the same uh, school together. They've been going there since they were eight weeks old, five days a week. It's called the Lighthouse. And Jolie's best friend is named Jordy. And Jolie's best friend, Jordy, and she hold hands together as they, go to, as they take a nap at the Lighthouse. And when Jolie goes to bed at night, she tells her mom and she tells her dad, my best friend is Jordy. Well, Jolie came over to my house last week and she wears glasses. She had on her pink glasses, but they look different. They look so new. And I said, Jolie, uh, are those new glasses? She said, uh-huh, I just got them. I said, what happened? She said, my other ones broke. I said, what happened? She said, Jordy punched me in the glasses, in the face. And I said, really, Jordy punched you? in the glasses, in the face, and they broke. She said, uh-huh. And I said, why did Jordy punch you? And she said, very matter-of-factly, as if she totally understood, I sat in her chair. And her mother told me that that night when she went to bed, she said, Jordy is still my very best friend. And I thought of that passage where Jesus is talking, and I thought what that means, because Jesus, is your best friend always. And if we're going to be friends with Jesus, that means we're going to love everybody, not just by telling them that we love them, but in everything that we do. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for loving us, for being our best friend. And thank you that that means we love everyone. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, children. Have a great rest of your Sunday.
Thank you for that amazing piece of music that lifts our hearts and focuses our gaze on the possibilities that arise for all because of a risen Christ. Thank you for being part of this virtual and yet this very intimate worship experience on Sunday. We're we start a new series in this Easter season called The New Has Arrived. And last week, CJ really did a great job of setting the table for us by talking about a new way of being because of the risen Christ amidst, amidst us, amongst us. Thank you. And today I want to talk about a new way of seeing. And it comes to us out of Luke's gospel, uh, the 24th chapter. I invite us to listen for the word of the Lord. While they were saying these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. They were terrified and afraid. They thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you startled? Why are doubts arising in your hearts? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. It's really me. Touch me. See for a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones like you see I have. As he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Because they were wondering and questioning in the midst of their happiness, he said to them, have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of baked fish. And taking it, he ate it in front of them. Jesus said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law from Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He said to them, this is what is written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And a change of heart and life for the forgiveness of sins must be preached in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, thank you for helping us to see what we would not otherwise see. For helping us to feel what we would not otherwise see. Feel, therefore, to witness to others what we have seen and felt that we would not have done otherwise. Thank you, O God, for this Easter season. In Jesus' name, amen. Years ago, on vacation, I chose to do something that I did only one time called snuba diving. Uh, we were oceanside, and I'd always been fascinated by what it would be like to go scuba diving, but that requires training and certification, and, well, I'm on vacation. So here came an opportunity that, along with five or six other people, you can have, really, most of the fun of scuba diving without all of the training. They put you and about five other people with a lead belt and the fins and the mask and a snorkel, but they also give you the regulator that you put in your mouth that enables you to breathe through a tube about 30 feet long. You and about five other people, all with tubes about 30 feet long, tied to one generator, one oxygenator. And for the next 15, 20 minutes, you're able to go off the boat and down 20, 25 feet and stay down to explore sites wondrous, bizarre, beautiful, inspirational that, frankly, you simply couldn't do any other way. Fast forward, same number of years. Two Sundays ago, we show up in the darkness of Easter morning and begin to finish setting up in addition to the band, wondering who, how many might show up. Because, of course, we've been in a pandemic year and people have rightly stayed in place and stayed safe for themselves and for others. But out of the darkness came people with their coffee and their lawn chairs. 
And they kept appearing out of the darkness and filling the lawn. And by the time the second music piece of music was played, there were well over 125 people scattered across our lawn, welcoming the rising sun and doing it together. That 125 or so was followed by another 125 or 150, followed by another 200 or so at our 11 o'clock worship service, so that by the end of April 4th, we had nearly 500 people gathered for Easter praise and thanksgiving. Now, if you had told me three years ago that we had just barely 500 people for Easter, I probably would have cried in my grape juice. But in a pandemic year, I nearly had tears for joy, for we had not in over 13 months had this many of the body of Christ gathered at one time in one place, singing God's praises together. It was powerful. It was moving. It was strange. It was wondrous. It was beautiful. When we heard ourselves joining our voices together in singing a praise song, when we joined the chorus to sing the hallelujah chorus, people beamed. You could see that even behind masks as people joined in with the chorus. Lucille Trimble, 100 plus years old, made her way to the sanctuary to be here for Easter 2020. One, she who was born in 1920. And you could not contain the smile on Lucille that was from ear to ear. It was simply glory. But there was another aspect of glory that happened after the worship service when our appropriately named area, the gathering area, for the first time in 13 months lived up to its name. Because with the rising number of vaccinations and with everybody practicing good protocols, we gathered as the body of Christ. And I saw a few people sneak in some hip-to-hip, side-to-side hugs, saw a few tears as people shared their stories of how long it had been since they'd seen one another, of what they've lost, some of what they've gained, much of what they've grieved. What we did in the gathering area following worship was to share our scars of the past year. And in doing so, we were being completely theologically appropriate and consistent with the nature of the Christ, whose birth, death, and now resurrection we celebrated together. Luke is quick to tell us, in his gospel especially, that one must endure the scars in order to see in a new way, in order to recognize and to live into the new that has already arrived with the risen Christ, this inbreaking of the kingdom. What I didn't read and what just preceded the text with these disciples is that text of the walk to Emmaus backs up right to this story. And you remember in that story that two of the disciples are walking along and a third person joins them and it's Jesus, except they don't recognize him as Jesus, even though they carry on a conversation. The story is a little eerie, a little strange, and you just wonder Because they go through a whole conversation with a man that they've lived with for three years and don't recognize him until after the supper, he breaks the bread, offers the cup, and their eyes are opened. And then Jesus, Luke says, disappears. And they they exult saying, didn't our hearts burn within us when he gave us the understanding of the scriptures of all that must be fulfilled? That story ends, and this story begins, where suddenly Jesus appears amongst the disciples, who have just heard the testimony of the two that came back from the road to Emmaus, saying, as we did two Sundays ago, He is risen indeed. And they believed, 
kind of. Because Jesus appears in their midst in our story and they are suddenly unsettled. They are unnerved. And what's the first thing Jesus always says when those around him are unnerved? Peace. He recognizes they're not sure what to think and what to believe. Are they seeing a ghost? Which is a common Roman cultural understanding of what happens to people once they die. There's nothing left except their souls kind of floating around. But Luke wants us to be crystal clear that this is no ghost. And he offers two proofs through Jesus. His hands and his feet and some food. He tells the disciples twice, take a look at my hands, take a look at my feet. In John's gospel story, similar to this, where he talks to Thomas, says, look at the marks. Look where the nails were in my hands and my feet. Know that this is not a ghost. This is flesh and blood. And then to further make the point, Jesus asks, got anything to eat? And they quite nervously, I imagine, pull off some baked fish and hand shaking, hand it to him. Where Luke says very clearly, he eats it in front of them. To prove once and for all, were there any doubts remaining? This is, go this is no ghost. Because ghosts don't eat. And then, just as he did with the two on the walk to Emmaus, Luke repeats the phrase, Jesus opened their understanding to the Scriptures, which from the beginning, in the Hebrew Scriptures, through the Psalms, through the prophets, through the, through the present day, the Messiah must suffer. And the Messiah must die because of a sinful world that we partake in before he will rise. It's that part that Luke wants us to understand clearly. The two go together. Suffering and resurrection. There is not one without the other. As much as we would like to pray suffering in the way, as much as we would pray that there would be no suffering, we would simply be in opposition to what the witness of Scripture has been ever since the beginning. That for reasons we'll just have to ask God when we all get to heaven, suffering is part of the human condition. Redeeming suffering is the divine condition. That God takes anything and everything that comes at us and is able to redeem that suffering into resurrection. We don't like to go there. That is our human condition. We would rather come to Easter and for some not come until the next highlight, maybe next Christmas. We would like to have Easter and compartmentalize that as one day and then go to life as normal. We want to go to the celebration of Easter, but we sure don't want to go to the reminder of our betrayal and of Christ's suffering on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. Just check the attendance record of every church that's ever had those services. No, we want our Easter's, but we don't want to do the suffering. And that's understandable. But even the Apostle Paul's proclamation throughout his preaching and his writing, which says virtually zero about the nature of Jesus' resurrection, though we have four Gospels of witness, Paul, whose letters were written before the Gospels were ever written, says virtually nothing about the nature of the resurrection. What Paul does say consistently, though, is that it is his death and his resurrection that he is to preach. That all who come to believe the death and the resurrection can be saved. This ministry of repentance, forgiveness, and new life. 
No, the scars that we talked about with one another as we stood in the gathering space for my understanding as a Christian and certainly as a pastor was just as important as what we sang for hallelujahs here in the sanctuary. For when we begin to inquire, when we begin to pray for, when we begin to talk about the loss and the grief and the scars of one another with one another, then we're able to claim and witness the power of the resurrection beyond the scars in our own lives and to express with confidence that that's what's going to happen in the lives of those who believe and for whom we pray. Now, it would seem that our ark of salvation, ever since God liberated Israel from Egypt, is an ark of wandering through a wilderness to get to a promised land, of wandering with Jesus through a wilderness of temptation in order to claim the God who redeems and who wander through a wilderness of Gethsemane and Golgotha before we too can exit the tomb of our lives in new life. I do not think it's overstating it to say that we are just now, and I think with Easter, almost 500 people in attendance, most we'd had in 14 months. I don't think it's overstating it to say that we too were finally coming out of a tomb of pandemic. And being, being able to claim the new life promised to us, a resurrected life that will not look like what it was before. That nothing that we did before will ever be quite that way again. And we ought not to be afraid of that. That God takes the broken pieces of our lives, and the broken pieces of our world, and knits them back together in something stronger and better than what we knew before when we have eyes to see, ears to hear, and a faith to trust. You may have heard of the art form from Japan called kintsugi. Kintsugi is an ancient art form whereby when a ceramic bowl or cup, a dish, plate is broken, an artisan or an amateur works to lay out those pieces and with an acrylic that is super strong and melded with gold flake, piece by piece puts those broken pieces together. It's painstaking. It takes a while. But the finished product is the original product with its scars, with the cracks. But the cracks are made of gold and they shine. And the result is that the new piece, redeemed, healed, put back together, is actually stronger than the original cup, dish, or bowl. Friends, I'm keenly aware that our lives, like our church, is changing. That post-pandemic will not be like it was before the pandemic. And Easter gave us a glimpse that the new has arrived. The question will be, can we see as the disciples began to see what resurrection life looks like. What are the implications of that, not just for me, but for others? That my salvation is not just for me, one and done, but the salvation is for the world. Because I'm willing to have compassion for the scars of others because of the Christ who had compassion for my scars out of his scars and has knit me back together, and is knitting us back together in new ways that we couldn't have known a year and a half ago, but are beginning to see now. And if we are faithful, and if we are prayerful, we will, by the Holy Spirit, be knitting back together something called church that will be vaguely familiar 
and yet not the same as what we left 14 months ago. It's not been defined. We are forming it. Even as I preach, this church is figuring out how do we redefine who we are and what we do as a church. It will look different. Because each one of us, like those snuba divers, we will all be breathing out of one breath, out of one generation of life, the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit of the risen Christ. The Christ, we said, is already in our future, awaiting us to catch up and to behold what the Spirit is helping us fashion together with one another and with one another's scars into something that is glorious and beautiful and stronger than it ever was before. This is the new way of seeing for those that have eyes to see and ears to hear. This is the good news. May we, as a new church, hear it, claim it, and as Jesus said, be witnesses to it wherever we go. Amen. I have a confession to make. It is Easter season. Seems appropriate. I know Jesus will still love me. My father-in-law and I were both in an NCAA March Madness bracket pool. And we all had to put in like $20 each. I'm not sure that's in the book of discipline. I could be in trouble here. But there were about 20 people in this bracket. And I came in second place. And my father in law came in third place. And uh, we didn't do the bracket, so I can't claim any... any um, malfeasance there, but we just took second and third, and with that came a small pile of money. And I asked my father-in-law, I said, what would you like me to do with this? He's in San Diego, and he said, put it toward the food pantry. There are hungry people in your church and around your church. And I got that text message, and I said, dang, now I've got to do something like that with my winnings. So my father-in-law, as a witness of generosity and compassion for others, certainly led me to do likewise. What is the grace that comes into your life, unexpected, that you are in turn using as a gracious outreach to others? We do that a lot around here, and I invite your consideration of the same. Thank you for your generosity.
I want you to think about whatever you need peace from, God. We'll grant it to you. I know everybody in this world right now can use some peace. And I just pray this song over you. Wherever you are, I hope the Holy Spirit comes and gives you that peace. Sing this with me. Let faith rise up, oh heart. Oh, oh. 